Um, okay, hello everybody. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you very much for bringing me to your gorgeous city to, uh, to present this talk. Um, I get a nice wee holiday out of the whole thing, so that's really nice. Um, so, my name's Chris. Um, I, I manage a, a nearshore development centre in Northern Ireland. Um, if I speak too quickly, please let me know. I'll try and slow down. Um, where we um, manage the sort of the stock market data coming off exchanges for one of the, the world's um, biggest investment banks. Um, and KX is a technology that has existed for about 25 years, yet I imagine probably no one in the room has heard of it before um, because it's been very quietly um, being used in the banking industry, um, managing all of their big data problems um, that have existed for quite a long time. Um, but now we're at a point where the rest of the world is starting to catch up in terms of um, the amount of data that they need. And so we're saying, well, actually, hang on. If you need to be able to manage these big data problems, we can help with this. We've got lots of experience. Um, so just, as, just a quick, uh, some of this is going to be a little bit salesy because I want to give you an introduction into what the language is and who we are. Um, but I, I will go a little bit more technical later on. Um, so KX Systems is a company that's it's actually a division of First Derivatives. I, I'm actually employed by First Derivatives, um, but we bought a major, majority shareholding in, in KX Systems um, in 2014. Um, we've got a large user community, not the same sort of size as, as traditional languages like Java or, or something like that. Um, in, in, in the thousands, though. Um, it's been very, very well used in the, in the financial services industry. So just to give you an idea of the sort of volumes that we are facing in the financial industry, um, so like a, uh, an FX system, um, which is obviously bringing and ingesting data off of the, the different um, foreign exchange markets across the world, um, you're looking at something maybe in the region of 1.3, 1.4 terabytes of data per day that that's actually bringing through the system that you have to take in, uh, analyze in real time to be able to provide um, both alerts or... Um, algorithmic trading um, patterns. So someone actually mentioned earlier about there being 40% of the, mar the trading activity on markets being done automatically. This is the sort of technology that's allowing that to happen. Storing it down and then being able to do historical queries on that data that's been stored down across, um, you know, maybe up as far as five or ten years um, to be able to, to sort of see different trends that are going on. So this is what you need to be able to do with the Internet of Things. We've been doing this for years, so we're here, and we, we want to just, you know, we, we can help. Um, so, uh, yep, yeah, so processing, and, yeah. anyway, next. So, our clients who, oh, I didn't realize this was all, uh, sorry, I, I wasn't expecting that to, to come up like that. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, some of our clients, this isn't all of them, but um, sort of the first thing that sort of jumps out is you've got lots of big financial companies on there, some, some of them big investment banks like Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Um, you then have exchanges, so what have you got the IEX, you've got the Singapore Exchange. Um, and then flipping onto the other side, you then have the surveillance companies or authorities. So you have the SEC there in the middle, actually, and you have ASIC, which is the Australian Securities Commission. They're using KX now to monitor the trading activities on the exchanges um, to the point where they can get um, real-time alerts of, of any, any time any fraudulent activity is happening on the exchanges. Um, and be able to go back and pinpoint areas of time where they feel something fraudulent might have been going on, and then they can replay it down and actually zoom right into where what was what, what actually happened um, over that period of time, which they can then match up with things like Twitter feeds or, or news articles that have come out, and just check to see that things like insider trading have or haven't been happening. Um, but so that's obviously all on the sort of financial side. Um, but we do have a few places there where we've started to move outside of that now. Um, so the likes of the IES up there, which is a, an energy company in, uh, in, in Ontario. You've got the US Army there actually in the middle as well, and, and a few other companies. But I'll, I'll come back to, to some of the other things we've been doing outside of uh, um, finance shortly. Okay, so um, someone actually mentioned the three Vs of um, big data earlier, um, the last talk actually. Velocity, volume, variety. So this is a sort of uh, map of where all the different technologies sit roughly. We're very much up in the top there between velocity and volume, um, which is you know huge volumes of data being streamed through in real time, um, where, where you've got to be able to do both uh, historical analysis on them as well as being able to provide uh, real time uh, analytics as well. Um, so as I say, 20-year 20, 20 track record in mission-critical systems. 
um, streaming real-time historical data, processing, analyzing data in microseconds. Now, um, KX has lots of various different ways of doing times. Like time, it's a time series database, um, and it's got maybe six or seven different types of way of storing dates and, and timestamps in different formats. It's, and it's got nanosecond precision, which means it's actually more accurate than some CPUs, which is quite an interesting one. Um, uh, hundreds of millions of transactions per second, and we're we're in the sort of area of looking terabytes to petabytes and beyond. So, uh, what is it? Um, so we've got KX and Q, um, and you'll quite often hear people talking about KDB Plus as well um, whenever you're looking into this. So, um, the technology is an integrated columnar database and programming system. Uh, so the idea here is that instead of having to have one technology to store your data on disk, one technology to store in memory um, data grids, for example, and then another technology um, that's going to query your database and then actually run the analytics and do all the different things. And you have to have programmers that are able to do all the different things in those different technologies. Um, one technology, one query language, one analytical language, it's all, it's all the same. Um, so KX is the actual database technology for in-memory and on-disk databases. Um, and it's got a client-server architecture. Now, that's very important in the way this sets up because it allows communication with different processes. So you can have one process that's dedicated to actually looking at the data on disk and, and having your, your historical database, and then another process which is your dedicated real-time database, and then another process that's actually querying the two, two of those to bring the queries together and run the analytics, and, and um, provides a nice sort of throughput of um, the system. I'll, I'll show you some, some stuff about the architecture later on. And then Q is the, the language that we use both for querying and for, for doing um, various calculations and things. So it's a fully interpreted language. Uh, and it's a vector programming language as well, which is, which is very important. So um, Q, as I said at the top, is a columnar database, which means whenever we're storing data, either in memory or on disk, actually all of the columns are stored as arrays, or we, we call them lists. Um, but they are effectively vectors. So instead of having to do loops, if you wanted to sum things up or, or do, do um, any sort of manipulation on those lists, you can use vector-based programming as well. And this is very, very heavily influenced by APL, um, which was a very mathematical um, language. It was quite very difficult programming to language to actually type in because you needed a special keyboard and things. I don't know if, has anybody seen APL before? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but it's an incredibly powerful language. But with, it's, with Q, it's very easy to learn, very easy to use. And it has an SQL-like syntax as well for, for data extraction and analysis. Um, so it's very easy for someone um, used to SQL to be able to get started up and actually actually program in it as well. Um, so just some other things to mention around that. It also has inbuilt parallelization, so you can do multi-threading or distribution out to, to different machines and different hosts as well. Um, and just some statistics. Um, so 3 million single inserts, updates, joins, and selects per second per core. Um, 20 million bulk inserts, so obviously taking advantage of the fact that if you um, effectively what you're doing is appending onto lists, so you can 3 million if you're doing single row inserts at a time, 20 million if you, if you batch them up. Um, for doing actual queries, if the table is in memory, 300 million records per second for in-memory table scans per core. Once again, using the ability to, to multi-thread and, and different things, you can, you can start to in increase these numbers as well. So, um, key thing, uh, KX supports streaming, real-time and historical analysis in one platform. Um, so it's, uh, the sort of overall arbitrage of the, or infrastructure arbitrage um, involved is, is very much minimized by the fact that with a team of a few core developers, you can actually get a lot of things up and running in a very, very short time scale, which we'll, we'll see shortly without having to have a big, um, uh, yeah, a, a big system infrastructure that's very difficult to maintain. Um, supports thousands of concurrent time series queries involving billions of rows of data. So obviously, Internet of Things, data coming off sensors, it's all going to be sort of time stamp based and time series. So that's really important. And the size of the database, it's just limited by your, your disk and RAM capacity and, and things like that. Um, so some benchmarks. We really like benchmarks, um, partly because we always look really good, um, but also because it's very important that in order to make the, the technology as efficient and, and continually um, making it better and better, that you, you understand what the technology can do now, where it sits, and, and, and whenever you make any changes, how does that affect um, where you were before? 
So this is a, a sample, um, some, some queries. I'll show you the queries in a second. Um, now, this is actually, this is still looking at financial data um, just because the data is there and, it, and, it, and it, it, it's, it's good quality. So we have the, the NICE trading quote data for 5,000 days, which has 1.1 trillion quotes and 65 billion trades. As a raw text file, that's 100 terabytes of data. So we're looking at a machine. So we tend to use big memory machines, um, so 256 gigabytes. I've seen machines um, with one terabyte or three terabytes of, 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 of memory on them. Um, but 16 cores, uh, uh, I'm not talking about the, the date partitions, I think that's a bit too much. And just, just comparing across some different, um, some different other technologies. Now these are, these are results that are done in our labs. Um, so they are internal benchmarks. I'll, I'll move on to some, uh, some independent benchmarks shortly. Um, but here you have four queries that were run. The milliseconds it took to, to run those queries across the smallest day of data, so 40 million rows, um, and then things like the, the RAM that was used in order to... Um, these, these are all on disk to begin with, so the RAM's used to, to bring the results into memory to be able to run that query. Um, the estimated time to load, and the overhead in the last corner there is in terms of just how long does it take to run just a normal, some, some, some sort of simple query in the, on, on the, the programming language so you can have an idea of um, what, what the, yeah, the actual load time and things like that. Um, so as you can see, uh, KX at the top there is um, significantly faster in the first three um, queries and in the fourth one, which is actually a bitemporal query, which I'll show you in a second, um, most of them didn't actually finish the query either. So just in terms of what, what, are, these, what are these queries doing? Um, so select back last bid by sim from quote where date equals D sim in S. So over the far, far side there, D is the date, whichever date it was, um, and S is the list of the top 100 symbols, I think is what they're running on. Um, so, and so the group buys are quite easy. So we're literally the last bid price that was on the quote table um, grouped into symbols um, for those uh, 100 symbols that were quoted. So in my mind, that's quite quite a simple query. Um, similarly, uh, question two, or query two, maximum price um, by size or by symbol and exchange from the trade table. Question, or query three, the average size, so that's the, the volume that was actually traded um, by sim. And this time.hh, that's bucketing into one hour, one hour chunks, so you can see um, uh, over the course of the day, what were the, the what were the sizes traded during the day, which is very useful to be able to see. Um, and query four is where it gets really interesting because as I said, this is a bi-temporal query. So you have a trade table and you have a quote table. One of the things that's really important to be able to see is for all of the trades that happened during the day, um, <laughs> I've already got five minutes left, okay. Um, what was your last quote time? What was the previous quote that was made before that, before that happened? And so this, this query four is being able to look at the two tables, scanning across the two tables, and being able to join the two tables together um, to show you what the last bid price was um, at the, when the trade was made. Independent benchmarks, um, I'm gonna skip through that a little bit quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, we, we always do well on those as well, and we, we, are, we, we work very um, closely with the stack um, research labs to do that. Okay, so where I was hoping to get to uh, five minutes ago, um, KX for sensors. This exists. We've actually got companies now that are using um, sensors, um, K uh, KDV Plus or KX, for their sensor analytics. Um, and we've been also um, working with um, Gartner Research, which is um, quite well respected um, research company, um, who have been looking into sort of different system infrastructures um, for uh, things like Internet of Things, and and so that, that um, a lot of s some of the things I'm talking about here are based quite strongly on a report that they. Um, brought out recently, which is completely independent. Um, so the idea here is lots of sensor, different types of sensors sending inputs in, ingesting the data, doing complex event processing, that's what CEP stands for, and then alerts at the end, um, being able to then run queries on it, and uh, yeah, just being able to get as much information from the data as possible in a shorter time, as, time frame as you can. So some of the things to think about, the automated real-time decisions and filtering of transactional data. So as the data comes in, do you need to make, send out any alerts? Do you need to, if, uh, say for example, um, a temperature reaches a certain threshold, uh, you might need to turn off a nuclear reactor, for example. That needs to happen really quickly. Um, <coughs> Real-time interactive analysis of data sets, being able to query it, 
granular data, data persistency, being able to store the data, um, and then being able to use that data that's historically stored, and then refining your decisions that you made at the start based on further uh, study. Um, okay, uh, sample um, uh, over system overview, um, where you've got your ticker plant, that's basically where you're ingesting the data and, and is in charge of bringing the data through your alert server, real-time memory database, historic column or database and benchmarks at the end there. Um, so I'm going to skip because I just want to get to the case study really to show you where this is being used. So North American Utility Company um, had a problem where they had 4 million sensors, started off they had over 200, 200 billion meter readings and it was growing by 100 million every day and they needed to be able to do real-time and historical analysis. So they did quite a lot of research to be able to work out what was the best um, solution for this. And they, and they started off and they looked within the industry and f tried to find out what other people were doing. Um, and they couldn't find anything that was able to do what they needed at a time frame that was suitable. And that was whenever they actually looked, started looking at other industries and they found the finance industry and they found us. Um, and so they, they, they brought in um, KX and, and we helped them get set up um, and, and looking at the data and massive improvement in query times. So a query that took 1.5 weeks before was dropped down to one hour and queries that took them hours previously now took seconds. Um, which massively changed the way that their business was able to to run uh, and make decisions. And some further successes. Um, so there's some academics that are looking into predictions of sunspot activity. Um, so you need microsecond response times. Um, a pharmaceutical company with 10 terabytes of data. A, uh, a data scientist from Wall Street actually arrived and started working at this pharmaceutical company and he had um, the 10 petabytes worth of data to be looked at. And it took two years, of, two year, or it took, in order to run queries on two years of data, you had to leave the system running overnight. Um, so he decided he would implement KX, and within three months he came up with a solution with a, with a team of people, um, and they were able to process the data on, or process queries on the full five years um, within minutes. So massive, massive improvement once again. Um, driverless mining vehicles, so we have Google and, and possibly Apple inventing uh, driverless cars, but driverless vehicles have been used in the mining industry for quite a long time. Um, they have hundreds of sensors, um, and you know they have to be able to store the data on the within the, the, the actual lo locally within the cab itself. KDB KX runs is fairly hardware ag agnostic. It, you can just pick up an off-the-shelf Linux chip for robotics or something, and you can s install KX on it um, to be able to run those sensors to be able to do that in, in harsh environments like in the mining industry um, and hard disk manufacturers. Oh, I'll skip that. One. So um, I think I'm pretty much at time. So. Uh, if that's been of interest to you, um, how to try it out, um, there's a free 32-bit version for non-commercial use. You can download it from kx.com. Um, there's lots of tutorials and help out there. So there's code.kx.com, which is the main sort of tutorial wiki for it. Um, it gives lots of advice. Um, YouTube, there's some, some intro introductory videos um, to get you up and running um, on, on YouTube. There's a uh, personal developers Google group, um, KX Systems page on, on GitHub. And uh, First Rivers also have a number of lecture series for sort of more advanced topics whenever you're going into the details of you know, advice on, on setting up your systems and, and the things that you can do with it. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and that's my name. That's my email address if you want to get in touch. Um, and uh, Twitter handles for KX Systems and FDPLC. And also just at the bottom there is the link for the, the paper that was released by Gartner um, about... Um, Internet of Things and, and um, looking at KX and streaming and analytics. So, thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, Leopold? So, it's all about uh, volume and speed. Uh, I'm wondering what what you are, are you getting out of the data? So, like you you said, you are measuring the sunspot activities in microseconds. What, what what's what's the use for it? Uh, okay, so in that in that use case, um, it's actually because the electronics on um, some of these satellites is obviously very expensive. Um, depending on the sun's rays that are coming out, the electronics can get damaged if they're if they're on and live. When some, some, I'm not an astronomer, so I don't really know what the details are. But basically, they need to be able to know and pr sort of use the data that's coming through off the sensors to know what what's happening up there, so that they can switch off the electronics or bring them away whenever the whenever the um, some sort of fl fl flare or something happens. Um. <laughs>
Well, one, one question I was uh, thinking about uh, before was, um, so, uh, I mean, 10 petabyte of, of data, I mean, it's quite a, a, a large amount of, of data. Um, what are typical problems that you run into if you're handling the, this amount of data? I mean, it's not straightforward. It's not like you're just connecting a USB drive and just copy it from A to B. Uh, I, I suppose there must be something like, uh, yeah, kind of mass, uh, massive uh, storage area networks behind it, that data synchronization issues and so on. Yeah, um, I mean, that's, uh, that, that is definitely a problem, um, particularly, but I mean, a lot of that is, um, it's, it's all down to the hardware mostly. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you've got 10 petabytes of data you need to store, you're going to have to have some sort of server form or something that's able to store that data, um, and then you're making sure you back it up. But a lot of that's done at the system level, because um, KDB Plus actually uses the underlying file system to store the data. Um, so that you know, and that, that's why it works really well with different operating systems. So it's very agnostic in terms of operating system: Windows, Linux, Unix, um, Mac OS, and everything. So, it, and it uses the inbuilt file systems, which means you can then use um, various different um, techniques for that are industry standard for being able to to handle those problems. But um, are there any specific issues with this kind of data size? Uh? Um, well, it's it's all down to knowing what you want to do with the data to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, there, there's various different ways you can store the data to split it up into different ways or effectively stripe it in different ways and provide extra um, sort of attributes and efficiencies on top of that. I mean, there's, there's various amounts of multi-threading you can do to get the data off the disk and things like that as well. Um, but in terms of the way the data is stored, it's, because it's columnar, means and it's you can split up say for example in the finance industry you're very often looking to query across different dates so what you actually do is you store it split up by dates which means whenever you want to query the 10 petabytes of data you only have to go and look at the one date that you need and look at only the columns that you're actually looking for because of the fact that you are doing something like maximum price you only need to look at the price column and the sim column you don't need to look at the rest of the row at all um, and, and so that that's how you can then start to get those efficiencies because of the fact that um, you don't need to look at the whole database. Most of it can just be left on disk and alone. Mm -hmm. And you memory map it into memory so it knows where everything is on disk and then it's able to get access to those quickly. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? So, well done. Thank you, Chris, again. <laughs>